we had a soccer team and we're kind of chosen, I don't know how, how they chose us, but there's 16 of us. There's only four of us left to this very day. The other 12, some were in car accidents, some slashed your wrists, some, uh, quite a few of them had drug overdoses. Every one of them died a violent death and every one of them was sexually abused by their brothers in the Regenta schools. And that always bothered me. There's four of us left. Uh, you know, what happened to me? Was I different? Was I wrong? Or, you know, why am I still here? My dad saw the first European come. He was a little boy. My grandfather opened his arms up, come into my home, showed him how to hunt, showed him how to fish, showed him how to survive through the hard winters they had. Pretty soon more and more Europeans come. Pretty soon they banned our lawn houses. Anybody that practiced their spiritual dancing, they were jailed for it. But that wasn't good enough. They brought in the residential school. I was put in there in 1930. Only language I knew was my native tongue. 
when I spoke that, I got punished. And I was punished a lot. There's a lot of nights I went to bed without a meal, hungry. There's a lot of times I stood in a corner on my knees saying my prayers, and they had to hear me saying it, or else I get punished some more. My parents were threatened if I didn't go to that school. They were going to be put in jail. The Indian agent and the police were there. So I had to go. Everything that we learned, everything that we heard about our community and about our people was negative. The only way we were going to succeed was to become like them, to acquire their values, to accept their spiritual beliefs, their spirituality, to speak their language. And that's what the residential schools were all about. They were designed to assimilate our people into the mainstream. And they understood that the best way of doing that was to remove us from the influence of the family. That's why they put us away for 10 months of the year. That's why they denied us our language, our culture, our spirituality. And it was at, ter at a terrific cost to our people. And we are still paying the price today. We are paying the price today, and we will continue to pay for some time to come. Unless, and I say unless, our leaders decide that healing is so critical to the future of our people. And that healing means coming face to face with the whole residential, residential school experience. I think in preparing myself to come here, I was asking my grandmother, come here with me today and to give me strength inside from all of our families and all of the people that were part of our family that had any kind of strength to come in and help me face this place. Inside of myself, I knew that when I came here, that all of my memories were connected to this child that, that lived here so long ago. But actually coming back here, I sort of knew that I would see things that would stir other feelings. And I prayed so that I would be strong enough to face all these new feelings. I remember first coming here because I, back then I remember thinking I was going home at the end of the day. Because to me, school meant they would go get on a bus and they would go off and then they would come back. So when my brother and I were coming here, I thought I was going home at the end of the day. And when we came up through this way and we met all these people, all these priests and nuns, and got my number and went over to the boys' side, and all these boys were there. Got into my first fight. It was like I had enough of this now. So when I finally found my brother, we were separated because of our age, and I think they separated all brothers so that you didn't associate with the family. Um, when I finally caught up with him, I said, well, you know, I had enough of this, let's go home now. And he said, you can't go home, you know, we're here forever.
I just always thought I liked basketball, you know. And when I was in there, I could really hear the to bamp, to bamp, to bamp, and having to to use my right hand and and dribble along that line. I had to dribble it straight before I could go and eat. And I I got into the gym and I then I could remember when I was six and the ball was so big. And it was difficult to keep it under control and, and there was all kinds of pain inside. In all my preparation in coming here today, I'd never expected to feel that. that That six-year-old child had no reason to be there. Didn't deserve that. No child at that age deserved to be pushed around like that. I hated it. There was lots of anger and lots of hate, but most of all, it was just like lots of sorrow because I was no longer a kid. so terrified of that boat ride. They tried to get me inside. It was raining. I would not go. I would not go. <sighs> Finally, we got to Cape Brown and I looked up and I thought, wow. <laughs> I was going there to look after my brothers. Because <sighs> I, was, I always looked after them. I always looked after the younger ones. <sighs> when one of the girls wet their beds, now the little girls wet their beds. They would be dragged all the way down the stairs, down to the shower room, turn the cold water on, and everybody had to have a look. So when my little sister got there, I used to make sure that I used, if I, I used to make sure that somebody used to wake me up, and I'd go up and sneak up there and change her, change her sheets. It's about two o'clock in the morning. One night I forgot, I forgot about it. Next morning she was being dragged. <laughs> when I got beaten up in residential school, I was told not to say anything about it. I was taught not to cry. And I learned that very well. Being thrashed on the hands, um, on the arms, on the back. And now, to this day, I can, I can take any kind of beating and feel nothing. I can take any kind of mental or emotional abuse and feel nothing. Um, I had no way of communication in my teenage years. I had Nothing. I was working, yes, but working for alcohol, that's all I was doing. So I can drink and forget about what happened to me as a child. I 
my drinking got so bad that that I took a life because I was hurting. So I wanted someone else to hurt worse than I, than I am. And that life I took is my daughter's. The minute you step it, your foot into residential school, you're given a number. And I forget what the heck mine was, 64 or something like that. But anyway, you're assigned a number, everything. Everything's numbered. Your shirt, your underwear, your pants, everything. Your jacket, everything has, has your number on there. And uh, we used to um, go down to the playgrounds. We'd, we'd play, well, especially on, on weekends. and. Uh, when you played, you never really played, enjoyed yourself as much as you tried to enjoy kicking a soccer ball around or uh, play on the swings or, or pitch, pitch horseshoes. You never en enjoyed the game until you heard the whistle. Up on the fourth floor, the brother would come out and he'd blow the whistle. And he, all he'd do was shout at number. 34, 10, any number you wanted, uh, any number he wanted. And you knew darn well that that, num that boy had to go up and he spent the rest of the afternoon with the brother up in his room to entertain the brother. And you know what that, what's happening to that person in that room. And after a person was chosen, then, then we could play at ease because you knew you weren't going to be next. You, your number then come up. The biggest experience and hardship for me is, is learning that the people we had come to trust were, were not all that trustful. We believed them to be holy people, people who would be there for us, that prayed for us and would always care for us, nurture us while we're at the residential school. And all along, I guess, probably one of the hardest things was getting a being sexually abused by by one of the brothers and I guess hiding it for most of my life until I turned 36. I was almost nine years ago. So by the time I was 16, when I left until I was 36, the whole abuse stayed deep within my heart, my soul. I, I would not allow it to come out. And I would not talk to anybody about that part of my life. Sometimes your brother or the, or the priest would come in and you kind of hear their beads and they would come in and, and you're laying there and then you'd hear them whisper, you know, hush now. And then they would pack somebody out. I couldn't understand why they chose who they chose. But it was god awful painful because they were there for a few days and they couldn't walk. And they weren't allowed to talk into, to anybody. We were so isolated here, not just from home, but from each other. I couldn't talk to my brother. I couldn't talk to my cousins once I found out which families they were from. And I couldn't talk to them, even my friends about what happened to me because there was so much shame that I was evil. That's why this happened to me. And you look at the other boys, they're so happy. Nothing's happening to them. So you're the evil one. So it was that shame that kept that silence for me for so long.
I really feel that they were hypocrites of the worst kind for the things that they'd done to Aboriginal people who were forced to go to the residential school, who had no choice, and who really, really didn't know how to respond to all their advances and all their actions they carried out. I felt so helpless. I was a little guy, and I thought, well, maybe this is what religious people do. It's a very lonely life to live and experience those memories of the past. It's, it, it just, it's a bad dream. It doesn't go away. It'd be nice to see a lot of our people sleep comfortably. I know a lot of people are just as goddamn miserable as I am after 10 beer. The, the stories I hear the, and uh, some of my friends laugh at them, make fun of them because they're perverts there in the residential schools. Perverts in the past, they weren't perverts, they're abused. And a lot of my friends are crying out for help and yet nobody hears them. And yet the, the hardest part is we all seem to cry out for help, but when it, the help is there knocking on the doorstep, we don't respond. We don't go answer the door. We just want to keep it inside us again. Why? It's, we, just, we don't know how to talk about it, I guess. Our peoples used to have talking circles a long time ago, you know, and it generally wasn't for um, hard times, it was for decision making. And they always had talking circles, family circles, where, you know, how was your day today? What, you know, what was the best things you, that you did today? What was the worst things that happened to you today? And they, they got rid of all these feelings. So in the past 150 years, we've become accustomed to hanging on to our feelings and not saying nothing. So with uh, bringing back the custom of the talking stick, um, it just felt like that I wanted to do this one. Um, and the otter here is on top. Um, in the human figure would be myself here, and then the different faces here would be also myself, as to the different parts of me, different moods, and the anger and the pain and stuff. But uh, the otter here being being one of my favorite characters, um, be uh, the fisherman in me, because I'd, I'd rather be fishing um, in any situation, you know, like today. circle in the talking circle we have that opportunity to go back and the wonderfulness of it is, is that we can go into a talking circle every day and talk about the same kind of pain until we are done with it because in today's world if you go and talk to some therapist or somebody and you tell them a problem you go back the next day and oh yeah yeah you said that before yeah 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 you know get on with it get over it you know and most of us need that time until we are done with it. We talk until we are done with it, and it's healing. What the talking circle has really done for me is helped me go back there emotionally and started to heal the nine-year-old emotions, the nine-year-old kid, and bring him up to date. Quitting drinking was the, the first part of it. Um, 
that was how I answered everything, was to take a drink, get drunk, and then all of my feelings would come out. In order to change all of that, I had to understand that there was an awful lot of feelings that were controlling why I drank. And the modern day world thinks that if you can get rid of the alcohol, then you have a better person. But in, in my own life, before I stopped drinking, I was a drunken, you know, and then you can fill in the rest of that. And then when I sobered up, I was a sober one. And it was not nice. I mean, I was still as miserable. I just didn't drink. So I started to understand there was more to sobering up than just quitting drinking. Then I started to awaken to a new life and what there is out there. And then I started to realize that things happened in my life when I was six and seven years old, nine years old, that I had to deal with. Now being 35, when I quit drinking, I had to look back on that stuff and deal with that. In the ceremonies that we have here this morning, that we have young people coming in, young men coming in, and some of them for the first time taking part of this. And it's really exciting to see because I quit drinking and I started changing my life at 35. Some of these guys are wanting the change of life, 17, 18 years old. Many of us can remember the first time we went into the sweat. There's a lot of feelings that happen when we're the first time in there, because really we don't know what's going on. And we ask the Creator and the Eagle Spirits to take our prayers in the sweat, take it above to the Creator and help us understand. The Eagle Feather is just like a human being. It's like you and I. If you look at it, it has a backbone here, just like all of us. Somebody laughs at you, picks at you, hurts your feelings, pushes you around. This is what happens to the eagle feather. This is what happens to you as a human being. Each time somebody puts you down on the street, it's like frazzling you. And all of us, this happens to us. A part of what Talking Circle and the Sweat Lodge is all about, it's about healing. So if you take a look at the feather now, it's all frazzled. Lots of people would look at it and say, hmm, not a nice feather, throw it away. But like the human being, with a little care, if somebody laughs at you and you go to a talking circle and talk about the feelings there, you start to heal. Like the eagle feather, as you start to take care of it, it all goes back like nothing has ever happened to it. A lot of people think that the sweat lodge ceremonies in our talking circles have to do with religion. Not so. It has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with taking care of ourselves, believing that there's a creator who is greater than ourselves and understanding. And it's not about punishment. Like many of the religions are about punishment, the sweat lodge is not about punishment. It's about healing. I made the, the first step was admitting I have a problem I, with, uh, with the Catholic schools, with the residential schools. And uh, that was 
my first step, and I'm, I have yet to encounter my second step, which is probably the biggest step. Is um, for years, I still do it to this very day. Uh, I drown my sorrows a lot in alcohol. It's a pretty good way of escaping. Uh, once I can deal with the alcohol problem, which is, is a, a big factor in my life at the moment, is get, getting rid of it or, and tackling the problems, because I know the problems are there. It's just a matter of me come to grips with myself, it's just, it's not easy to, to, uh, to, to wreck, you can see the problem and yet uh, you, you just keep hiding yourself in, I, I don't like to say it, but an alcohol, I do. A lot of things are going to need to happen. Um, for many of them, I can see because of the different backgrounds they have, many of them are going to take this to the grave with them and never ever get around to dealing with it. Um, for their children and their grandchildren, there's going to come a time where in their life they will come to the point where I have, I've had enough. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and then something will happen. It may not even come really clear that this here at residential school had very much to do with it. But if they can look in their family background, they will start seeing that the behaviors they have stems from here. I think too that uh, the Catholic Church has to address the problem. They have to come out and admit their wrongdoings the priest, the brothers, the nuns uh, abused us in, in such a way that it has hurt and scarred a lot of people. They have to come out and acknowledge it, recognize that there is a problem. You know, they, once they do that, that, that it'll help us, I think, too. Part of our healing process is the Catholic Church saying, yes, we screwed up. My big thing is I gotta disclose this to the, the task force, the, the RCMP, so I'm really hoping once I do that, and then people will know that I've done it, and they're gonna come forth. And then once that starts to happen, then all our people are gonna start healing. How's it going? Oh, not too bad. A little bit nervous? nervous. Oh, hey, don't worry about it, we'll get you together. Yeah. That's what it's all about, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, you got some support with you? Yes, my wife. Hi. My love. Hi. How you doing? Hi. Brian Hi. Sampson. Please, Mr. Carson. It surprises me to a point, but I think maybe I should have disclosed to my brother. Because all along we probably be, could have been the the, the very good support to each other because we both came from the same residential school kind of thing and I think we could have been very supportive in many ways a lot earlier so that's what yeah that's what they the residential school set out to do eh? they set out to to conquer us mind body and spirit they've done a pretty damn good job just like you're saying you're my brother and I'm 43 you're 45 first time we talk about this, mm -hmm. it just kind of, where in the hell have we been for the past 20 years, 25 years? I think it's going to be a great big part of our healing is to sit back and reflect on what we talked about during the day and realize all the things that we've been through. I think that's always a big part of our lives as we look back as to what's happened in our life and then we want to change. So from today on, there's going to be a big change. And, and Tony. 
and Tony and uh, <laughs> he, has yeah. more pro- he has more problems than me. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> I work with people every day. <laughs> Sometimes I get a sense that I'm healed because there's such a tremendous amount of happiness in my life. And other times I get a sense, because of my memory, I get a sense that there's a lot more work to do. Um, not, not as hard as this first part. It'll never be that hard again. But I know now that for affecting my children, that is almost all gone. But there's a few little things in there that all of a sudden clicks back and brings back memories. New memories come up and and then I gotta work on dealing with those. So sometimes I get a sense that, you know, I could be working at this the rest of my life. Today it's been wonderful because I stand here with pride, something I I didn't have too much of in my early days. I have this wonderful pride inside looking at all your faces smiling at me. And that's wonderful. I mean, that's so exciting. Family is so important to me now. And you are all a part of my family. This morning, we were married out in Kinnipsen in the beautifulness of from where I was raised. And an eagle soared above, came in, spread his wings over the ceremony. And the whole thing was so exciting. I could feel the happiness in the crowd. And my own happiness is trembling all over again inside, just thinking about it. Because I remember hearing stories about our people didn't sign on these little pieces of paper, but they would hold a potlatch and they would invite people like you to come and witness this event. And should anybody question it, we would be called upon you to say what you have seen here today. And I kind of like that part of our culture. I am Indian. You take a look at my art, you take a look at what I do in in my life, I am Indian. Um, I was redirected for a long ways and it was a hard trail and and my family and and, um, all of our people have been redirected for a long time. But for myself, they have failed because here I learned that that I was an idiot and I was stupid and I was dumb and, and I wasn't going to go very far and all those messages stayed in my head. But when I take a look at my going back to grade 12, getting my grade 12 and going back to college, I'm an A student. I went in and took um, alcohol and drug training. I got B minus and I got some A's and, 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 and I got good grades. I am smart. I am intelligent. So that tells me that the messages they they gave me just got in the way for a long time. And if our people are really strong at heart, they can make it this far too, to this place where I am proud to be an Indian today. I am proud to be who I am. And I am proud where my family comes from. And I'm proud of my heritage. And yeah, it's a big deterrent and it's a pain, but 
you know, we've survived and all their efforts, they have failed because I am here today.